Okay, good day. This is AP Calculus. I am Mr. McCulley, and this is the presentation for section 1.5, infinite limits and limits at infinity. And those two things do mean something different. So let's get right to it. So today we are going to determine infinite limits from the left and the right and review limits at infinity, which is something we did in pre-calculus. And then we are going to find and sketch vertical asymptotes of a function. So let's talk about these things. So first, infinite limits. So this, it, when I say something has an infinite limit, that means that the result of the limit is infinity. That is how we're going to define that. So... Let's talk about two functions, and then we'll talk about the limits of those functions. So I have this function here. So f of x equals 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. And as you can see, if I were to plug in 1, 1 minus 1 would be 0. And that 0 does not uh, reduce with a factor in the numerator. So uh, that, that zero is going to cause a non-removable discontinuity that we learned in the last section. And it's going to cause us to have a vertical asymptote. So let's graph this real quick. It's not too hard. When I plug in zero, zero minus one is negative one. Negative one squared would be uh, positive one. One over one would be one. So Oops, didn't mean to do that. I need to get my pen tool here. So I got one, and you can notice I have one, two, three, four tick marks, and it's two. So each tick mark is going to be a half. So I get zero there. When I plug in a half, one, or yeah, half, one minus one half would be negative one half. Negative one half squared would be positive one quarter. One divided by a quarter would be four, which would be way up here. So I'm going to end up with a graph. That looks kind of like this, at least on the left-hand side. Now, when I come in from the right, I'm going to get something similar. Let's say I plugged in 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 squared would be 1. 1 over 1 is 1. So at 2, I would have a y value of 1. And then when at 1 and a half, 1 and 1 half minus 1 is just a half. Half squared is a quarter. 1 divided by a quarter is 4. And so this would be 4, by the way. And so again, I, I'm going to get a quarter, so I'm going to have this thing. So we can talk about limits. Now, the limit, and I didn't mean to have those there. This is my second try on these, so you'll have to imagine that they weren't there. Now, remember when we talked about the definition of limit, the left hand side or the left side of limit had to exist, the right side limit had to exist, and the two limits had to be the same. So when I talk about this particular function here, when I come in from the left, it's going to go towards positive infinity. And as I come in from the right, it's going to go towards positive infinity. So the limit of this function, even though it doesn't exist at x equals 1, is in fact going to be infinity. Now when we talk about another function that's similar it's a little bit different let's talk about this function here f of x equals negative 1 over x minus 1 and again i notice when i plug in positive 1 1 minus 1 would give me 0 and this factor doesn't cancel with the uh, any factors in the numerator so i'm going to get this vertical asymptote here and i know that so let's graph it real quick if, if i plug in 1 1 minus 1 Oops, if I plug in 0, not 1, that's the y value. If I plug in 0, I get negative 1 divided by negative 1, which give me 1. That's why that point's there. If I plug in a half, a half minus 1 would be negative 1 half. And so one, negative 1 divided by negative 1 half is going to be 2. So I'm going to get a graph that's similar although not quite as steep as the last one, it's going to look very similar to that. Now when I plug in 2, I come in from the right-hand side on the x-axis, y-axis. I come in from the right-hand side. If I plug in 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. Negative 1 divided by 1 is negative 1, and so I'll get that. And then when I plug in 1 and 1 half, 1 and 1 half minus 1 is just a half. Negative 1 divided by a half is going to be negative 2, which would be down here. So I'm not really going to graph it, but you get the point. It's going to look something like this, and eventually it's going to get closer. So clearly, because this left hand goes up and this right hand side goes down, when I talk about the limit 
as I go to just one, that's not going to exist because the values go to different places. But we can still say that the left-sided limit, as x goes to 1 from the left-hand side, is going to still be positive infinity. And as I come in from the right-hand side, the limit as x comes goes to 1 from the right, in this case, is going to be negative infinity. And if we were to just extend this a little bit, once again, the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x would not exist. All right, so let's talk about the definition of a vertical asymptote. Let f, b, and g be two continuous functions on an open interval containing c. And so if we want to relate that back to this last one here, we have two functions. This will be my f function. This will be my g function. They're both continuous on any given interval a to b because they're both polynomial functions. And so some constant c. So what I'm talking about here is I have two functions here on some open interval, and they don't even, I don't even think they label it. But here's my open interval. We'll call it a to b, and we'll say this is some value c right there. All right. So f of c cannot be equal to zero, and g of c would be equal to zero. So in that case, g of c would equal to zero. There exists an open interval containing c such that uh, g of x is not equal to zero for all c, or x not equal to c in the interval. Then the graph of the function given by this function, so um, the only place on this interval is where x is equal to, or g of, g of c is equal to zero. It's the only place. That's the only place on this interval, according to the definition. Then we know we have to have a vertical asymptote. I don't know why I'm using yellow. I can't hardly see yellow. I meant to use red. That's a little bit better. I'm going to have that vertical asymptote, and it just it doesn't really matter how I draw it in there. I can draw it like that or like that. Okay, some properties of infinite limits. And we've got two functions here. And as we're going to see, we've got an infinite function. And this one definitely has limits. So I've got two functions. Stop that. I've got two functions. And as x goes to some constant c, the first function has a limit at infinity. And the second function, as x goes to c, has some definite limit. And so they can talk about some values here. Some are different. If um, we go x goes to c, we have infinity. We have a, a limit at infinity and a constant limit. So if I add something that grows without bound to something constant, no matter how big or how small that is going to be, and again, you can't really add infinity. Infinity is a concept, but we can think of it this way. We are adding something that grows without bound to something that's constant. So we're growing, adding bigger and bigger, bigger numbers to something that's constant. So obviously that's going to go to infinity. Now, if we multiply a constant, that's something that grows without bound. It's just going to grow without bound only faster. The reason we have two different expressions for a product, though, is they say L greater than zero. Well, L greater than zero would be a positive number. So I have a bunch of positive numbers that grow without bound times a positive number. So the result's going to be positive infinity. And if L is less than zero, that's going to make it negative. So since F goes to positive infinity, when I multiply positive numbers times a negative number, the result will be negative. And then finally, the quotient, if G grows without, or G is just some value, and this is infinity, well, it doesn't matter how big L is. Eventually, using something that grows without bound, when we divide those bigger and bigger and bigger numbers by constant, no matter how big L is, eventually it's going to go to zero. So just some quick properties there. And so some quick examples. So we have um, to determine the limit as X approaches positive infinity and negative infinity and as X approaches three from both the left and the right. So here I want to take a moment because as x approaches positive and negative infinity, we're reviewing limits at infinity. And this we did in 
pre-calculus and there were three rules when you let something go to infinity. So this is a little bit different. Here we had a limit whose result was infinity. When I say limit at infinity, I am going to say what is happening in the limit as x goes to positive infinity of x over x squared minus 9. So in this case, a limit at infinity is when you let x go to infinity or grow without bound. Or what happens is it goes to the right. Now, for rational functions like this one, as x goes to infinity, remember we had three rules. You compared the degree of the numerator to the degree of the denominator. The degree of the numerator in this one is just positive, or is just one, and the degree of the denominator is two. And so as x goes to infinity, even though this value grows without bound, this value grows without bound much bigger. And it, um, just real quick, one, two, three, four, five, these only change by one. But when I do, if I call this n, and I want to call this n squared, you get one, four, nine, 16, 25, and the space between these gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so clearly, 1 divided by 1 would be 1. 1 divided by 4 is a half. 1 divided by, or 3 divided by 9 is a third. You get a fourth, a fifth. And so it's just going to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And so this particular limit is 0. All right. Now, if I talk the limit, as x goes to negative infinity, goes to the other way. Well, when we do the same thing, this is an, these are all negative values, right? But when I square them, they become positive values. So I got a negative divided by a positive. This negative 9, it'll definitely affect our values um, as we're close to the origin. But as we get really big, this subtract 9 isn't going to make a big difference. So I have a negative, a value going, uh, I have negative values on the top, I have positive values on the top, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. Um, so even though this thing is going to be negative, it's still going to shrink to zero in both instances, even though I get a negative. All right, now I also have to talk about three from the left and right. So the next question says, what is the limit in I really took a shortcut and I need to fix that and I apologize folks because I would have counted that as minus one limit of what equaling to zero now I could you know what let's do it this way and I'll, and, and I'll allow this the limit as x goes to infinity as long as you have f of x is defined as an equation we can go f of x and now we get zero so you either and this still has to be negative infinity now you could do this or you could do limit as x goes to negative infinity of x over x squared minus 9 equal to 0. Both of those would be okay, but you can't just leave it out. So I need to be more careful, so do you. So let's get let's let's try and do that. I admonish myself. Okay, so Let's talk about this. They also want me to do uh, x approaches negative 3 from the left and the right. So that is a left-sided limit. So if I go x goes to negative 3 from the left-hand side, x over x squared minus 9. All right, well, we know that that's going to be the same as the limit as x goes to negative 3 from the right of um, x over, well, I'll get x minus 3 x plus 3 because this is a difference of squares still not going to cancel okay so it's not going to cancel so let's talk about what that thing's going to look like i'm obviously going to have an infinite limit here and you can look at your graph and calculator to give you a good idea um, so if i come in from the left so i'm something real close to negative 3 so it's going to be a little bit of uh, the magnitude is bigger than 3 so it'd be like negative 3.1 let's say so negative 3.1 minus 3 is going to be a negative number, get negative 6. Negative 3.1 plus 3 is still going to be a negative number. And so negative times a negative would be a positive. So I get a positive number on the top. I've got a negative number, or excuse me, I got a positive number on the bottom and a negative number on the top. So uh, negative divided by a positive, this is going to go to negative infinity. 
and then the limit as x goes to negative 3 from the right. And again, being careful, limit x squared minus uh, 9. I don't think I need to redo this because I'm not going to get anything to cancel. So again, if I come from the uh, right-hand side, uh, we'll have something like 2.9. So 2.9 or negative 2.9 squared is going to be a positive number. Now it takes negative 3 squared to get 9. So negative say 2.9 squared is going to be positive. But when I subtract 9 from it, since it's going to be smaller than 9, I'm going to get a negative number. I'll get a negative divided by a negative. So this one is going to be positive infinity. Okay, let's look at the next one. Find the vertical asymptotes of the graph of the following equation. Okay, vertical asymptotes. Well, let's take a look at this thing. Uh, x squared minus 5x plus 25. Ugh, that thing doesn't look like it's going to factor very nice for me. Um, I don't think it's going to factor at all because there's no two factors of 25. Both have to either be positive or both have to be negative. They're going to add up to negative 5. I mean, I got to have negative 1 and negative 25, negative 5 and negative 5, neither. So that's not going to factor to a whole number. This thing is a sum of cubes. So we got to go all the way back to Algebra 2. Um, x, uh, let's do it this way. So just as a review, a to the third plus b to the third, that's going to equal factoring a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared and just as a real quick review a square or a to the third minus b to the third equal to a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared and this thing doesn't factor anymore that's just one of one of the properties this thing doesn't factor anything anymore and so when i look at this one this one doesn't factor, so x squared minus 5x plus 25, and its zeros might be imaginary, I'm not sure, but I know x plus 5 is a zero, and I've got, uh, let's see, it'll be x squared, and then plus 5x, oh, no, it won't be, oh, look at that, oh, that's going to come out, I need to make my zero. We'll, re we'll redo it. I'll get x squared minus 5x plus 25 over. I'll get x, let's see here, x plus 5. And it'll be x squared minus 5x plus 5 squared is 25. So even though this may have real zeros, those real zeros are going to cancel out. So this thing, uh, as far as vertical asymptotes go, is going to be equivalent to 1 over x plus 5. So at x equals negative 5 is the only vertical asymptote. Groovy, that came out better than I thought. Okay, find the one-sided limit if it exists. Okay, let's talk about this. This asks me, as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side, so I'm coming in from the right, find the one-sided limit if it exists. Well, properties of limit says that I can say that this thing would be, let's see here, um, the limit as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side of just 6 minus the limit as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side of 1 over x to the third. Okay, so the limit of this is just going to be 6. And then this limit, as it goes to 0, I get 1 divided by, and so since I'm coming in from the right, I'm going to have positive numbers, so positive to the third. When I take a number that's very, very small and I cube it, 
are very, very close, not necessarily very, very small, but very, very close to zero. That's positive. I'll multiply it by itself three times. So positive times a positive is positive. Something one divided by something very small is going to be in very, very large. So this thing is going to go to infinity and clearly there's a vertical asymptote at zero. But this thing is going to go to infinity. Um, now, just back here from our properties, when I add or subtract, all right, I'm subtracting a value that's going to be infinity. So that we can also think of, oops, go here, think of this negative as a reflection about the x-axis for the function 1 over x to the third. And so we can say that this limit is negative infinity. Okay, move on. Let's take a look at these two. So we've got an infinite limit that goes to negative infinity and 3. And so the limit as x goes to c of negative infinity plus 3, that's going to be just negative infinity. If I multiply here, I've got negative infinity times 3. And again, we're not actually multiplying negative infinity. We're multiplying numbers that are negative, that grow negatively without bound times positive 3. That's going to give me negative infinity. And we go, as x goes to c, g has a limiting value of positive 3. So that limit here would be 3. This would go to negative infinity. So no matter how big this 3 is, as x goes towards negative infinity, its magnitude is going to get bigger and bigger, and those numbers are going to be negative. So I've got a constant divided by a very, very large in magnitude negative number, and that's going to give me 0. Now, as I get as x goes towards negative or goes towards c I'm going towards negative infinity so it would be 3 divided by a negative number but 0 is neither positive or negative so we're just going to leave it okay true or false the graphs of polynomial functions have no vertical or horizontal asymptotes I haven't asked a true or false but Think of this, remember all of our polynomial functions, f of x, I know this goes all the way back to algebra 2, but a sub n, x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub two, uh, 1, and let's just redo it, ah, plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 1x plus a sub 0. So that's what all polynomial functions have. Now, we just said in our definition for vertical asymptote, where'd that go? There it is, vertical asymptote. So f and g are continuous functions. So for us to have a vertical asymptote, we have to have some sort of division in here. And so since polynomial functions can't have a variable in the denominator of any of these terms, we know that there's no way for us to have a vertical asymptote. So the graphs of polynomial functions have no horizontal or vertical asymptotes. That is true. All right, we are almost done. Star Wars fun fact of the day. Before Star Wars, George Lucas had made two films, THX 120, uh, 1128, something like that, and American Graffiti was his second one, and it's uh, how well American Graffiti did that allowed him to get the funding for Star Wars, and the way he came up with a name for this little guy here, R2-D2, everybody knows who that is, is um, during the... the uh, recording of American Graffiti at the end. Usually what happens is they do the lines on set and then they go back into a studio and re-record the lines so they have a clean track. But during the editing, George Lucas asked for reel two of the second dialogue track and the sound editor came back and said, here's R2-D2. He liked it so much that he kept it and that is how this little guy right here got his name. Okay, folks, that's all I got. Have a good day. See you in class. Goodbye.